what we're saying is that our desire to have more has influenced the way that we have used technology. Agreed? Agreed. Right. That's what I'm saying is the problem. What's your name? Uh, Linus. Linus? Yeah. Bob. Bob. Is this your first time in the park? Uh, I've been once or twice before, but I just was past So as you see, as you saw earlier, you end up with people who come alongside you and spill lies in your ears about people. So it'd be interesting to know what he said in your ear and then I'd reply to that at the end. Right. But let's continue with our conversation for now. So you were talking about industrialization. Yeah. Um, isn't inherently leading to ecological collapse. Yeah, it's, and a, it's a contingent. Yes, and I totally agree. But here's what my argument is premised on. is premised on that that contingency, that contingency is a product of the human heart. That we have approached technology with pride in our knowledge and not humility in our foibles and weaknesses. I would, I would disagree. I think that our misuse of technology comes from the societies we've lived in. And um, who, how do we create those societies? Aren't they, don't they emerge from us? No, I think, but I think just saying it's a simple cause and effect is, I think that's simplest. Well, 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 let, 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 since you, we've got a point of contention, yeah. let's examine the point of contention. Right. You, you're saying it came from societies. Would you agree societies are the product of the collective will of the human beings in them? Or at least the powerful? Um, that's an interesting question. I would say that I think humans begin to organise into societies that complex, right? But then I think they, the material conditions of those societies begin to shape cultures, and then that sort of depend, that sort of affects the way the humans. I think it's one of the ingredients. W would you agree that the way that we shaped our societies in our life is on the back of the effects of the industrial revolution? Um, I think the way we use industrial technology... Not my question. Yeah, the, 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 the quickest way to lose an argument is not to answer the question that's been asked, but to okay. restructure the question. Right. So my question, because you said that the, the, the material realities affect the way we construct societies. Yes. So I'm saying to you that the industrial revolution is one such material reality. Is it fair for me to say that we've created our society out of... The, uh, one of the significant ingredients, yes. not the only one, but one of the significant ingredients is the Industrial Revolution. Yes. So, so far my argument stands then that there is a connection between the Industrial Revolution, its effects on the planet, and the bit that I'm getting, the bit, the bit, the whole, my whole argument was, uh, was on. And this is a really important point because it, it's one of the ways that Christians think differently from modern people. Is that we think that it, it, it comes from within and goes outwards. Whereas moderns, because of people like Marx, think that it's outwards going in. Do you see the difference? Yeah, and, yeah I would say I'm probably a modern. Right. So, so what I'm saying is that at the Industrial Revolution, we fell into the trap quite unthinkingly, not deliberately, into being enchanted by our own ability. We could do something, so we did do something. And it was almost like, because we can, we will. What can we do? Let's push on the boundaries of technology. Let's, let's push technology ever further forward. Progress, progress, progress. Is it a mantra that sounds familiar? Yeah. Right. And I'm saying that 200 years ago, we made a terrible mistake. What we should have done is develop technology, but not develop it in pride of our knowledge, but in humility of our weaknesses, recognizing that we will always that we'll always screw up and that we'll use technology for bad things as well as it just producing bad things. And I'm basing that argument on the realities of what has happened with the Industrial Revolution. So, your reply to that? Um, I would say that that sort of assumes that we create technology. A lot, a lot of technology is created just, I don't know, by uh, scientists, just thinkers. Are scientists a part of the we? Uh, yeah. I'd right. Say. So, so, no, well, so, guess, the, where, where's the argument? No, I guess my point is that um, it sort of ignores why technology comes about. I believe the industrial revolution came about out of human sort of desire to multiply, to create more, to have greater material uh, resources to access. Would you agree that that human beings don't have to live with a desire for consumption? 
Right. So what we're saying is that our desire to have more has influenced the way that we have used technology. Agreed? Agreed. Right. That's what I'm saying is the problem. We approach technology in an attitude of we can. It was guided by our foibles and our weaknesses, our desires, our pride, our lust, our envy, rather than approaching technology with humility that because we've got pride and lust and envy and greed, that actually we might end up doing bad things with the technology we create, either accidentally or on purpose. So we were unwise at the Industrial Revolution. And I'm saying that the evidence of that unwiseness is the ecological collapse that we're now living in, that you're going to suffer with more than mine and your children will suffer with. Do you know? And we're going to, and we're making the same mistake with the genetic revolution. I guess my, my point of disagreement then is less descriptive. I think we both agree on. I think I think maybe because I'm not a Christian, I think I probably have different views on what should be done. I think we both agree that terrible and mistakes have been being made with industrialism. I think. There is a point of contention on... The point of contention is whether it's going outward in or inward out. Yeah. And, and this is one of the things that we Christians can teach the modern world. Because we have held on to the view that actually everything that we see around us has come from within us. The way we have formed and fashioned the world has emerged from within us. When we've either allowed us to be guided or allowed ourselves to be guided by the best or by the worst. The problem with the modern world, the, the world that you've been educated in and cultivated in, is that it's based upon something that's not true. Marx was wrong when he said that it's just outward in. You're not a blank, you weren't born a blank sheet of paper. I, I agree, you, there wasn't much written on the sheet of paper. The Christian view doesn't say that there was loads written on the sheet of paper. But we say that there was something written on the sheet of paper. And then society comes in and puts in the other stuff. But this, this one line, this one line affects whatever society writes in the rest. So, I mean, I guess maybe I haven't, done enough, I haven't educated myself on one line topic. What is that one line? Human beings are selfish. Okay. Right. But we try to construct a society in denial of that truth. I think I would disagree that human beings are naturally selfish. Okay, so what, what would you be, what, in, in the full weight of history, with all the murders, rapings, pillagings, destruction and slavery, genocides, holocausts, grasping for power, deceit, manipulation, what, 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 what are you going to point to to say that humanity are not inherently selfish? I, I, don't, I don't know the exact I, I would say pre-modern, but that, that implies sort of... Uh, well, pre-modern gets you back just beyond the 1700s, yeah, no, no, no. so you're still in trouble. Um, so yeah, no, that's what I was saying. Um, I would say pre-civilization, pre sort of hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers yeah. killed one another. They, they did. You know the Homo sapien wiped out the Neanderthal, yeah, right? No. Well, I think isn't there a debate over that whether that was interbreeding or it was just well, It was both. Yeah, okay. Right, um, so, but, but the thing is, that demonstrates that human behavior hasn't changed. But I think, I think just to crime that selfish, I think we may be, I mean, you can look at, you can give the example of altruistic tribes where, I mean, I, I, personally what I've read um, is that human beings only begin to think atomistically as think, think of themselves as individuals once there's a surplus of food and that only comes about with agriculture. So we only begin to see ourselves, even like the concept of thinking, seeing as in, like, um, individual selfishness doesn't make sense. So, so let, let's talk about your mythical altruistic tribes. Yeah. And the reason why I know they're mythical, right, is because every single one of the tribes that ever gets points to by people who make this argument, that, that basically what they're doing is they're, they're, they're picking up some romanticized vision of these old tribes, yeah, that they've picked up from the media. And it's not actually based on any real study. So, yeah, so, I haven't picked this up from really. I, I promise you. Okay, so so which altruistic tribe are we talking about? Um, obviously, I read the book like uh, six months ago. I couldn't give you a name. Um, where are they in the world? Uh, where do they exist? Yes. Uh, I, I, I remember one, two examples. One was in West China, and one was in. These are the ones I remember best. And one was sort of in the Nigeria, uh, East, West Africa. And do they have territory? Um, I, I don't know. Yes, they do. All of these tribes have territory, all of these I, I tribes. 
contemporary tribes or because I'm talking about tribes as they existed before even civilization. Yeah, and they all had territory and they all fought one another and they killed one another. They fought to defend their territory, they fought to defend their resources. So, so this altruistic tribe is a, a modern myth. At least what, what I've read is that when a tribe sort of came into resource depletion, well, this is not resource for everyone. At the time, at least, at, um, I think, I can't remember what year, at some point on Earth's history, there was around 100,000 humans, no? We, our population decreased massively. Um, with the amount of space there was on the Earth, I, it would make more sense for a tribe just to move to a more fertile land. I mean, Africa's massive, with, it's still a fertile land. Europe is massive. But, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that you're basing your argument on something that never existed. There was never this innocent hippie tribe that just thought, we share and we make love. Never existed. And, and no one can point to it in history. You can't point to it in history. Your book that you read six months ago didn't point to it. I promise you it didn't. Because you're either only remembering the bits that you want to, or you've misunderstood the book, or maybe even the book doesn't exist. But no, no. I, I guarantee there's no such thing as some hippie tribe of the past. It is a modern myth, and it's a modern myth because the way human beings work is they communicate by stories. We communicate values through stories. And so the creation of the hippie tribe of the past is just a way that the modern man tries to communicate some different way of being human by inventing something that didn't exist. The Christian faith also communicates values through stories. So we tell an, uh, an origin story in the book of Genesis. And the origin the, the, one of the, the things that comes out of the origin story of the book of Genesis is this idea that human beings are innately broken, that they are sinful, and that, that sinfulness can be described in language that's not religious as selfishness. It's called the selfish gene. We see it in the development of language. The point of developing language that is particular is so that it can exclude others. You know, so, and, and we, we, the, the Bible tells that story as well, that the, the, the sinfulness of man resulted in God breaking their languages because it broke them into different languages because that that sinfulness of man, that pride in technology, because they were building this tower that goes to heaven, yeah, was, was res going to result in their destruction. So it's a parable of, of what happened in human nature. It also is a parable that parallels the truth, because human beings obviously originated from the same original family, which means that we did originally speak the same language, and then we differentiated our languages. So the, the stories of the Bible you'll find that they, they tell a mythological story that parallels actual truth. In a time when Bronze Age man, because these are Bronze Age stories, had no reason to assume these things, had no knowledge to assume these things, and had no ability to grasp at such knowledge, which I think is something you should consider. How is it that these Bronze Age men managed to tell these stories in such a way that it actually parallels realities? For instance, Genesis says that light started before the sun. Sounds like a contradiction when you first think about it. But in the collapsing dust cloud that forms a sun, as it heats up, it emits light. It doesn't just go from nothing to sun in one moment. It takes millions of years. And as it collapses and gets tighter and tighter and tighter, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it emits light, but it's not a sun yet. So the Bible says light came before the sun, and we now know that light came before the sun. That was not something that Bronze Age man could have known. The Bible says that all the continents were once together. It says, God said to um, the waters, move back so that dry land might be appear. And it said all the waters moved into one place. If all the waters move into one place, where's all the land? In another place, as one. That one seems a bit more like a stretch, no? Yeah, but, but, but the thing is, that there, there was no way for the ancient man to have known that all land originated as a giant mass. But then why did no Christian scholar claim that before we, before modern? Because they had no reason to. Why, why, they, 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 people in the past didn't think in a scientific paradigm. We think in a scientific paradigm. So the thing that was important, for instance, from the time of Jesus to the present, 
the thing that was important was philosophy. That was what philosophy was to the ancients, what science is to us. So we try to filter everything through science. In ancient Roman times, when our Lord was alive, they filtered everything through philosophy. So they would have asked philosophical questions, not scientific questions. But I think to just separate the two is completely different fields. I mean, there's a philosophy of science. Um, people like, oh, I'm trying to think of the... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not denying that there's a philosophy of science, but the philosophy of science emerged as a response to the development of science and the paradigm shift that occurred in our society. My, the point that I'm getting at is that the Enlightenment, and you're a child of the Enlightenment, has denied you access to your inheritance, has denied you access to knowledge that you need to know, wisdom, has denied you access to a way of thinking about yourself and about life that Christianity gives you. And one of the examples of this is the talk that I've just done, that we've approached technology with pride in our ability rather than humility in our weaknesses. I'm not against technology. What I'm saying is we're approaching it with the wrong attitude. And I'm using the Industrial Revolution as a proof of where that wrong attitude leads. Do you see my point? Yeah, so I, I guess I was incorrect in trying to make it a contingent argument, an argument about facts. Yeah. And it's really an ethical argument, and I guess the disagreement comes from me having a different ethical system to Christianity. Yeah. Probably. Right, and, and what I'm saying to you, bro, is that as a European, your inheritance is Christianity. Your heritage is Christianity. No, it just is. It, it is what is the past of Europe. And as a European, that it was your birthright, but you live in a society that has denied you any knowledge of it and has stereotyped it and has villainized it and, have, and has filled you with sentiments that make you think that it should be dismissed out of hand. But surely as a European, paganism is more my... If, if we're doing it, like, how far do we go back? Because... I mean, I'm, I'd send from Irish travellers, they only became Christian, what, very much later than the rest of Europe. I think it was like 10, I, I don't know, I don't know the exact date, so I'm not going to claim to. Yeah. But surely that's not my birthright if, you know, let's say the past 1,000 years, that was, that was a Catholic country. 1,000 years before, they were pagan. You know, I mean, I don't understand how that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, terms of, in terms of that very question, the, the, the Europe as we understand it, you, you can't even think about Europe without admitting it, its Christian influence. There wasn't a thing, an idea of a European civilization until Christianity. The idea of a European civilization is a fruit of Christianity. It's called Christendom. And it was this idea that there was... I have no idea what's going on here. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, he, but he is a bit of a he is a bit of a, a rowdy fella. He is, yeah. And he's been excluded by the Sunni Muslims. They're pushing him out of the park. Yeah. So anyway, the, 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 there wasn't a concept of Europe that was pagan. They didn't have it. The concept of Europe comes from Christianity. So if you are identifying as a European or claiming a European heritage, you can only do that with a Christian worldview. Because Christendom is what we in the West think of when we think of Europe. It defines our boundaries, it defines our cultural norms, our moral norms, our linguistic norms. It all emerges from the effect of Christianity upon the barbarians of Europe. And you've been denied all knowledge of this because the state doesn't want you to be Christian. And what I'm saying, bro, is claim your inheritance, claim your heritage, learn about it. Even if you decide, right, actually, no, it's not for me, at least make an informed decision. Don't let society make that decision for you, okay. or your family, or your friends. Okay. So, have you got a Bible? Uh, at home, yeah. Right, right, brilliant. I mean, that, that's another example of the fact that Christianity is this cultural echo that reverberates around our families. The fact that you've got a Bible, you're not even Christian. I, I'm my family. Right. So what I'm saying is, bro, like, they pick up that Bible, read it, and then come back and talk to me if you want to, right? Or go and talk to a knowledgeable Christian. Not an ignorant Christian, because every ignorant man has a belly button. And every ignorant man has an opinion, and they're one in the same. They don't hold much water. 
what you've got to do is you've got to go and speak to a knowledgeable person about the Christian faith to learn about it, to decide if actually, you know, I also want to follow in this way of being human, this following of Jesus Christ as one of his disciples. Yeah? Will you do that? Yeah, sure. All right, brilliant. What's your name again? Uh, Linus. Linus. Yeah. Uh, that's a brilliant name. Also a Christian one. Yeah, it's second pope, right? Yep, yep, yeah. yep, Pope Linus. So pick it up, talk to some knowledgeable Christians, come and talk to me if you can't find any, and, and learn about this faith. Don't just reject it because society has kind of nudged you in that direction. Yeah? I'd give you a, a Bible, but I haven't got one to give. So let me see what I've got. I try to give everyone who has a nice conversation with me a book. Let me. But you've got a Bible at home, so yeah. I'll not give you a Bible. But I want to show you what what Christianity does, right? To, to show you the impact that it has on people's lives and how it makes them different and behave differently from the moderns, which is what you are. Which is, this is the story of some Christian missionaries and about what they did among some of the poorest communities and some of the most dangerous communities um, and how they went to the poor and basically did things that were transformative to those poor communities. Because the Christian faith, if it is anything at all, it's got to be one that is lived. Not just contemplated and thought about, but something that does something in the real world. Okay. All right. There you go. Uh, I'll take it. How about next week? I'll come back and see if I have any questions about modernism and Christianity. I don't feel comfortable taking a book for someone I've only just met, you know? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. It was offered in sincerity, so we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk if you want to next week. Yeah, okay. What, just out of interest, what did that Muslim brother whisper into your ear while I was talking? Oh, he was just like, I didn't talk about anti Islam. Talking about technology. And then what else did he say? Oh, and then he said something about like, you, like, you debating Muslims all the time or something. Yeah. So, as you can see, he lied to you. Because I wasn't talking about anti Islam. Yeah. And I've just debated a non Muslim. There you go. Thank you. Just proof that the Dawah team lie. Okay. So. God bless you, Linus. Take care. So, what you saw is that a youth in the UK has no contact or knowledge of his own history, his own culture, and his own identity. It's been denied to him. And as Christians, what we've got to do is we've got to encourage people to reclaim that. And if you're a non-Christian who's watching this, if you or like that brother, you're not a Christian, but you are recognize yourself as a European, bearing in mind that there's no such thing as European identity without Christianity, then you owe it to yourselves to pick up a Bible, to learn about the Christian faith from knowledgeable people, and to decide whether you want to follow that or not. Don't allow the prompts and the nudgings of society to influence whether you accept or reject the Christian faith. But allow your own mind to make that decision based upon what you learn. Because as you can see, Christianity has meaningful things to say, not just to the individual, but to society itself, in the way that society conducts itself. God bless.